Eastern presented a hard choice. Refuse to go back into the courtroom where a black man asserting his rights was probably bound and gagged or return and continue to speak out. Dave favored refusal as an act of solidarity with the victim, but Tom Hayden offered a persuasive counter-argument. We have to go back in there. For us not to would be just what they want. They want an excuse to revoke our bail and stop us from preparing our defense. They want us in jail so that we can no longer travel around the country making speeches and rallying support. We have to be like the Vietnamese, who do what they have to do and feel no pain. I may vomit when I see Bobby bound and gagged, but we can't do anything to let them revoke our bail. By this time, the marshals were pounding angrily at the door. The defendants couldn't all agree, naturally, but finally they re-entered the court to find out what had happened. What they saw was this. Bobby Seale carried into the court, bound and gagged, his ankles and wrists painfully chained to the legs of his chair. At this point, Tom could no longer remain silent. Bobby Seale should not be put in a position of slavery. He wants to defend himself. They're going to beat him. They're going to beat him. May the record show that Mr. Hayden was addressing the jury while they were walking out here? I was not addressing the jury. I was trying to protect Mr. Seal. A man is supposed to be silent when he sees another man's nose being smashed? For his outburst, Tom received seven months' worth of contempt citations. But about a week later, because of the public scandal resulting from Judge Hoffman's tactics, he was forced to sever Bobby's case from the rest of the defendants. In the end... The government dropped the charges altogether against Bobby Seale. To talk about the trial and events surrounding it, here are several more of Dave's friends. We'll start with John Tucker, a lawyer who was involved. He'll introduce another short scene taken from the transcript. After that, we'll hear from others who remember those times. My introduction to the David Dellinger experience came in that famous conspiracy trial because of Arthur Kanoy. I was practicing law in Chicago at the time, and Arthur called my partner, Tom Sullivan, to represent the lawyers who Judge Hoffman had sent to prison for contempt of court before the trial. <laughs> and Tom asked me to help him. Five months later, as the trial was winding to a close and everybody knew that Judge Hoffman was going to send all of the defendants and the lawyers to jail <laughs> for contempt of court, uh, Arthur called again and asked us to represent those defendants and lawyers at the contempt proceedings in case Bill Kunstler and Len Weinglass were put in prison before they could make the necessary motions <laughs> to protect the record. And my first assignment was to uh, attend court while the contempt citations were being issued in order to make those motions. And thus I was in the courtroom on Saturday, February 14, 1970, when the judge began his contempt citations by reciting the charges against the first name defendant in the case, Dave Dellinger. What occurred next was the most extraordinary and emotionally draining experience that I have ever had in a courtroom in 30 years plus as a trial lawyer. By law, the judge was required to allow Dave to address the court before passing sentence on him. The transcript describes what happened next. I hope uh, you will do me the courtesy not to interrupt me while I am talking. I won't interrupt you as long as you are respectful. Well, I, I will talk about the facts, and the facts don't always encourage respect. Now, I want to point out, first of all, that the first two contempts cited against me concerned the war against Vietnam and racism in this country. The two issues this country refuses to solve, refuses to take seriously. I don't want you to talk politics. You see? That's one of the reasons I have needed to stand up and speak, because you have tried to keep what you call politics 
which means the truth out of this courtroom, just as the prosecution has. I will ask you to sit down. Therefore, it is necessary... I won't let you go on any You further. want us to be like good Germans, supporting the evils of our decade, and then when we refuse to be good Germans to come to Chicago, you want us to be like good Jews, going quietly and politely to the concentration camps, while you and this court suppress freedom and the truth? And the fact is that I'm not prepared to do that. You want us to stay in our place like black people who are supposed to stay in their place. Mr. Marshall, I will ask... Like poor people are supposed Mr. to Gallagher stay in our place. Down. Like people without formal education are supposed to stay in their place. Like women are supposed to stay in their I place. I will ask you to sit down. Like children. Like children are supposed to stay in their place. Like lawyers are supposed to stay in their place. It is a travesty on justice. And if you had any sense at all, you would know that the, the record that you read condemns you and not us. All right. And it will be one of thousands and thousands of rallying points for a new generation of Americans who will not put up with tyranny, who will not put up with a facade of democracy without the reality. Mr. Marshall, will you please ask him to sit down? I sat here and heard that man, Mr. Foran, say evil, terrible, dishonest things that even he could not believe in. I heard him say, and, and you expect me to be quiet and accept that without speaking up? People will no longer be quiet. People are going to speak up. I'm an old man, and I'm just speaking feebly and not too well, but I reflect the spirit that will echo... Take him out! ...throughout the world! Now, at that point, the transcript says that there was complete disorder in the courtroom. And it is no exaggeration. As two marshals tried to drag Dave away to the lockup, his daughter Michelle, who was 13 at the time, stood up and screamed something like, Don't hurt my dad. And her sister Natasha also stood and screamed, and several marshals, so marshals there must have been 20 of them in the courtroom, plowed into the audience, and jumped on the two girls. Dave yelled, leave my daughters alone, and he shucked off the marshals like a couple of annoying gnats, and he rushed to his daughter's aid, Joan joined by Abby Hoffman, and a couple of spect spectators, one of whom jumped over two, lay, uh, two rows of the spectator section onto the back of a marshal. And an army of marshals grabbed Dave to drag him away, and the courtroom utterly erupted. Bill Kunstler collapsed on the podium, weeping, and begged the judge to take him out of there and send him to jail so he could be out of that awful courtroom. <laughs> Jerry Rubin ran toward the judge shouting, Heil Hitler, and giving the Nazi salute. <laughs> Everyone, and, and I, I can't tell you how emotional this was. It wasn't really funny. It was awful. Everyone, the audience, the press, the defendants and their families and supporters were screaming or cursing or sobbing. No one who was there will ever forget it. It was truly an awful moment, but not a bad speech for a feeble old man, Dave. <laughs> and 30 years later, he's still making them, still demanding the right to tell the truth. So thank you, Dave Dellinger for over 60 years of eloquent, fearless insistence on telling the truth exactly as you see it. <laughs>